This is the great room at the Royal Society of Arts in December 1852. The same room where, just the previous year, in 1851, it was arranged for a rather famous exhibition to be staged in a completely enormous building made out of glass. I want you to imagine you're there just a few months after this event, listening with some hostility to a guest speaker talk about the stuff of fairy tales, regulating the most precision timepieces, chronometers, using balance springs made entirely of glass. On Monday, 30th of May, 1853, the post-talk discussion at the second extraordinary meeting of the Society of Arts got more than usually nasty. Marine engineer Francis Herbert Wenham had just set out his paper on constructing glass balance springs for timekeepers, a method he had developed in the late 1840s, where window glass, heated by a blowpipe and drawn into a thread, was wound onto a conical mandrel to form a spring, then dropped onto a hot iron bar. On contact, the conical spring would collapse into a flat spiral. Wenham would later note, up to the time my paper was read, I had not the slightest acquaintance with any chronometer maker. Poor Mr. Wenham. Before he could even begin to consider the advantages of glass over metal springs, less sensitive to temperature, corrosion, and magnetic influence, and, as has been shown in the late 1820s, capable of more perfect elasticity than the best steel, he came under the tuperative attack from that notoriously litigious bunch, not least Mr. Villamy and the Frodsham brothers, Charles and George, just a few of the eminent pot makers in the audience. When he found his first foray into the Society of Horologists, peremptorily denounced as one of the puffs of the trade. Glass springs, said the Frodshams, were ingenious but useless, and not to be mentioned in comparison with those of steel. If glass was on trial, then the experiment should be to make a mainspring of glass, that's the power source, not a balance spring that acts as a pacemaker. But why bother? Thousands of chronometers have been made successfully with steel springs, and the late, great John Roger Arnold had always repudiated any practical utility in using glass. So saying, Charles Frodsham took one from his pocket and showed the assembly this beautiful thing. A flat spiral balance spring, now in the British Museum, made in 1828 by Glasgow watchmaker James Scrimgeour, passed to the great Arnold by Scrimgeour in late 1841, and inherited by Frodsham along with Arnold's business in 1843. Lawyer, Cambridge Wrangler and clock designer Edward Edmund Beckett Dennison rose to the bait. In 1833, the celebrated chronometer maker Edward John Dent and his future stepson, Frederick Rippon, had used glass to produce a helical balance spring fitted in a chronometer now going 20 years and showing remarkable results. The backstory is well known. Arnold and Dent were then in business together, but the celebrated partnership came to an acrimonious end in 1840. And three years on, when Arnold died, Dent and Frodsham fought over who would take on his works and contracts. Following the 1840 dissolution of the partnership, Dent had become involved with Denison and with the construction of big public clocks, not least the clock for the Royal Exchange. And in 1852, he won the contract for the construction of the Westminster clock, Big Ben, that was designed by Denison. Dennett died in March 1853 while Big Ben was under construction, and his stepson and collaborator in Glass Springs, Frederick Ripple, took on his name and the Westminster contract. When Denison argued with Frodsham at the Society of Arts, less than two months on from Dennett's death, he addressed the meeting as the executor to the will of the recently deceased chronometer maker. Denison spoke on behalf of Dennett. He didn't have a glass spring in his pocket like Frodsham, but pointed instead to the great exhibition of 1851, where Dent's glass balance spring chronometer had been on display in that massive palace of glass. So this is the great exhibition in the Crystal Palace, and apparently in the corner there, that's the horological section. Those look a lot like dresses to me, but I'm not a horologist. The debate was now explicitly focused on Dent's work, and the audience divided. On the one hand, clockmakers ranged against dense glass balance springs, and on the other, designers who spoke for them. The Frodsham brothers and Dennison's uh, respective conclusions stand out, 
And I want to highlight them here because they set out the questions this talk looks to answer. Mr. George Frodsham said that if Mr. Dent's experiment had proved successful, it was quite certain he would have made more than one chronometer with the glass spring. If Dent's glass springs performed so well, why was there only one of them? By contrast, Mr. Dennison, on behalf of Mr. Dent, said the reason glass springs had not been brought into more general use was that they could not get the workmen to use them. The springs worked, but the men wouldn't. I'd like to ask you to keep these two points in mind. Why only one, and why would the workmen work glass? This talk looks to show they are central to understanding glass springs in context and the significance of dense glass for innovation, calibration, and standards in the age of reform. Since that 1853 meeting, historians and horologists have understood dense glass springs as an isolated curiosity, a one-off that didn't work out. It's only in the last year or so, thanks to the amazing generosity of the Antiquarian Horological Society, that unresearched archival material has been brought together with dense original springs in the British Museum. One unused helical spring at the bottom there, labelled B, looking very neat with its own original stand made of ebony and ivory. The other, labelled A, attached to a glass balance spring, showing some of the effects of the wear and tear from being trialled in a working chronometer. One of the exciting outcomes of this project is how it developed into a collaboration, enabling the first technical analysis of the composition of the springs by British Museum vitreous material scientist Andrew Meek, using variable, variable pressure scanning, electron microscopy, digital microscopy, and x-ray fluorescence. <clears throat> <clears throat> so these are from the digital microscopy of the two dense springs. And I'm showing them really as just a, a teaser of the kind of amazing things Andrew has been doing. On, uh, on this side A, we have the child spring, and on this side B, the unused one. And thanks to Andrew, you can see that they're actually a very different shape with the child spring flat and thick, while B, the unused one, is finer and rounder, something I'd like to come back to at the end of the talk. My background is as a doctoral candidate on a collaborative award between the University of Cambridge and Greenwich National Maritime Museum, researching precision instrumentation in the study of magnetism. I am not a horologist, but I was privileged to update and contribute to the most comprehensive survey we have of the networks that brought knowledge of glass working to the London trade by Anita McConnell. I'm going to come back to the springs, but some brief discussion of the history of glass making in Britain is important here. The glass springs need to be understood in the wider history of industrial organisation and economic and technical innovation at the height of the Industrial Revolution, a time when questions on free trade, whether in corn or glass, iron or labour, were central to the policy of industry and the fiscal state. To understand how and why glass springs might seem singular and workmen unwilling to deal with these materials, we need to understand the problem of the glass excise and its relation to the regulation of labour and trade. There are three aspects to emphasise. First, from its earliest introduction in Britain, glass making was heavily regulated by the state. Regulation that was achieved by constant surveillance, quantification of the raw materials of glass manufacture, and restricting the movements and rights of an immigrant workforce trafficked into the country and ghettoed in the glass works. This gives us the second point. The history of the regulation of glass in Britain is a history of social regulation. Since the introduction of the window tax at the end of the 17th century, glass not only became the means to extend state control into private domestic spaces, but it embodied tax. By the 18th century, glass was not only the most heavily and punitively regulated industry in Britain, but, and this gives us the third and final point, glass was tax. 1820s and 1830s Britain was in the middle of the glass crisis. Foreign imports of quality glass increasingly threatened Britain's market leadership. For those vocally lobbying for free trade, the glass industry was understood as like the corn market, strangled by regulations. Introduced in 1746 and intensified in 1812, the glass excise discriminated between common bottle glass with a low rate of tax and other glass subject to higher rates. Glass with a significant proportion of lead was one of the most heavily taxed, four times the rate imposed on common bottle. From the late 16th century, 
The state had used restrictions and privileges to push the shift from wood to coal burning production. Lead glass was developed as a response to the appalling conditions of the coal burning furnaces. The heat of these furnaces was such that it maimed the workers tasked with the constant stirring essential to produce homogeneous glass. With lead as a flux, the working temperature was lowered and the properties of the material transformed. The tax divided glass into strict classes that enforced severe hierarchies of skill and divisions of labor between different sectors of the trade, hampering innovation and blocking skill transfer, or so it was argued by leaders of the scientific community in the 1820s and 30s, who were strident lobbyists in calling for excise repeal. <coughs> when celebrated chemist Michael Faraday began on behalf of the Joint Board of Longitude and Royal Society Committee to attempt to reverse engineer fine German glass in 1824. He was frustrated by the geography and organization of this trade. I'll come back to the slide in a moment, but the relevance should become clear. In thinking about that geography and culture, a couple of episodes from early modern Britain's glass-making capital, the coal-based city of Newcastle, are particularly illustrative and set up an important idea for this talk in considering the relationship between glass, tax, and innovation. From the 14th century, Newcastle was run by an effective oligarchy of merchant guilds whose dignitaries occupied all the civic roles. By the early 17th century, this merchant elite lived in glass-fronted houses, serving the dual purpose of displaying their wares as well as their wealth and power. This power was consolidated with great quasi-religious processions through the town where the merchant aldermen would parade in all their official trappings and their households assembled in the fronts of the houses to spectate through the glass. Glass was the medium through which power relations were represented. This is a detail of a frieze that was in the Cordoners' room of the trade hall. Cordoners are shoemakers. The whole thing is about 11 foot long and in true British tradition, it was started in 1787 by a house painter, Alex Method, and not completed until 1825 by a different house painter, Harry Harland. In early November of 1789, the Cordoners of Newcastle, according to annual custom, made a grand procession through the streets of Newcastle and Gateshead in honour of King Crispin, that's the patron saint of Cordoners, and you can see Crispin with the crown there. Just a week later, and in direct response, the glassmakers of Newcastle also processed. But rather than the formal show of power by the elected elite, the march of the glassmakers satirized the coordinates with the most irresistibly comic humor. It was carnival, the subversion of the social order through the performance of the grotesque, and it got so out of hand, so unruly and outrageous, that processions were discontinued for over three decades. That is, until 1823, when for the first time since the 1789 outrages, the coordinates marched once again through Newcastle. The glassmakers again responded, but a carefully ordered affair this time, with the masters of the glasshouses inviting their men to march with their best and most curious pieces of workmanship. Here's the invite. The men responded by making the trappings of the coordinates march, the swords, bugles, feathers, hats, and badges of office, entirely out of glass. Even the cannons fired to mark the intervals of the procession were glass cannon. That's one of the original bugles. Many of the items from the procession still exist in the National Museum of Scotland, though not the cannon, sadly, presumably destroyed through overuse as a metaphor. Glass was tax, a medium of power and of social regulation but it was also a medium of social comment through distortion of the existing order. To quote the master of subversive caricature, Jonathan Swift, satire was a form of glass. Swift referred to the reflection of a mirror, but whether through reflection or refraction, this glass mediated observation of the existing order. And in the case of the Newcastle glassmakers, it was precisely the drive to satire that led to glass being deployed in such extraordinary, innovative ways completely counter to its usual classification. On the 31st of December, 1833, just months after Arnold and Dent first announced that they had successfully applied to the chronometer a balance frame made of glass, 
the partners wrote to complain to the then astronomer boy John Pond. Rival maker John Sweetman Leafy had deposited two chronometers for trial at the Royal Observatory, which, instead of the stipulated numbers, carried the names the Glass Fiddle and the Strand and Parliament. Writing from their premises on the Strand, just a few hundred yards from the most popular pantomime of the season, Harlequin and Cinderella, called the Glass Slipper, there can be no doubt, said Arnold and Dent, of the contempt intended towards us. Like the Newcastle glassmakers, Ify saw innovation in glass as the stuff of Saturn and the springs as a part of satirical theatre. Bibliometric analyses have shown that the origin of Cinderella's glass slipper lies in a 17th century mix-up over the medieval French for heraldic reason flow. I resisted the urge to put up a slide for reason. It was quite tough. <laughs> but the same vast analyses also show that the Cinderella story underwent a dramatic shift between 1830 and 1850. Early in the 1830s, the slipper that was simply glass, or weasel, became elastic glass. In the exhibition halls of London, waistcoats and shoes of glass cloth were displayed as the workmanship of Cinderella's prison. They were made from threads of elastic glass, drawn and wound, just as Dent did in the manufacture of his precision chronometer spreads. Here's an excerpt from caric caricaturist and book illustrator George Cruikshank's Cinderella, her shoes made of an elastic material and covered in spun glass. You can see Cinderella having a bad time and hanging over her public clock. I really want you to forget about all the Maria Prince Cinderella stuff and see this as a story about poor time management and exploitation in the workplace. Because by the early decades of the 19th century and above all in Cruikshank's hands, that's precisely what it was. In Cruikshank's social commentary, public clocks oversaw the regulation and exploitation of labor. His work reflected the contemporary preoccupation with labor relations, often riotous and always fraught in the public extension of time discipline. Cruikshank's close friend, Charles Dickens, was infuriated by what he saw as Cruikshank's tendency to ruin classic fairy tales with undue moralizing. In response, he made a satire of Cruikshank's Cinderella with a fairy godmother who first changed mice into horses free from the obnoxious and oppressive post horse duty, <laughs> then a rat into a state coachman not amenable to the iniquitous assessed taxes, before turning lizards into six footmen, each with a petition in favour of the early closing movement. The godmother's final act to put on Cinderella's feet a pair of shoes made of glass was carried out, observing that but for the abolition of the duty on that article, glass never could have been devoted to such purpose. The effect of all such taxes being to cramp invention and embarrass the producer to the manifest injury of the customer. The Cruikshank used the glass slipper to focus labour concerns quite general to Victorian society, and that Dickens read the glass slipper and heard satire and tax is fundamental to understanding the powerful equivocation in glass. Arnold and Dent were prompted to glass research by concern over the imperfect state of balance springs. The material of the balance spring affected going rate. Use hardened steel and the chronometer would gain rate. Use a soft material like gold or soft steel and it would lose. The problem was reduced by using hardened tempered steel of a couple of years use, so the tension in the structure had been worked out. However, steel came with other issues, highly susceptible to magnetism and rust. Further to this, and this is the really important point, Arnold and Dent noted that even the best chronometers, when exposed to extremes in temperature, would lose at the maximum and minimum. The 1833 announcement was not only the public debut of Dent's glass springs, but also the first statement of middle temperature error to appear in print. The firm's substitution of glass began as an attempt to do away with the material flaw, and it is compensation for middle temperature error that ultimately explains what happened to the springs. In July 1833, within months of the first announcement, Arnold and Dent deposited a glass spring chronometer number 616 at the Royal Observatory for trial. It is worthy to remark, noted Dent, that the improvement of the balance has followed that of its spring. This chronometer had a glass balance as well as its balance spring. <laughs>
We now know the glass at the spring was manufactured by Arnold and Dent themselves, and from purified synthetic materials quite distinct from the common window glass at the time. So the Springer flat spiral is the yellow trace, and you can see significant levels of silica, that's the Si, lime, that's the Ca, calcium, and potash, that's the K, potassium, and low lead, no PB. Okay. Further analyses also found particularly high strontium levels, indicative of a seaweed base like kelp. Basically, the Springer flat spiral is indeed common window glass. It makes a useful comparison with the dense springs, the red and blue traces. The red is the spring that was trialled, and the blue is the one that was just displayed. And you can see they are of an entirely different composition to the yellow trace. Though both dense springs are almost identical to one another, you can see a potassium spike on the blue trace, the untrialled spring, not present on the red. The significance of this will come back at the end of the talk, but that's a surface reading from the handling, uh, from handling in sweaty fingers. The dead springs are made from extremely pure, synthetically produced raw materials, saltpeter, quartz, and significantly really high lead. In fact, the composition of the dead springs is very close to the optical glass produced by Faraday and the 1820s Glass Commission, the most vocal lobby for the repeal of the glass tax. Theirs was a lead glass, like Dent's, loaded, loaded with one of the heaviest tax rates, two to three times that of window glass. Levied at the point of production rather than sale, this particular tax category involved the most intensive and relentless surveillance and intervention by the state, crippling even the manufacture of such tiny objects as these. Dent made direct reference to Faraday's Glass Commission and the scientific lobby, in lamenting the great expense of his lead glass research. Now this is the really important bit I need you to remember because we're going to come back to it. The glass balance disc shown by the green trace is a completely different composition again. It does not have that lead spike. It is closer in fact to the yellow Springberg trace. High in strontium, it's another kelp glass. It's that crucial detail I really want you to remember. It has no lead. In March 1836, three years on from the glass spring chronometer first being deposited at the observatory, hydrographer to the Admiralty Francis Beaufort wrote to the new astronomer royal George Biddle Airy, noting that Dent had applied to continue the rating of the glass spring chronometers, that as far as they had gone, the experiments were highly interesting, and added, I wish you would turn your powerful mind for a few minutes to the subject. For it is evidently in the balanced and balanced spring that we must now look for essential improvement in all chronometers. Over the next few months, the results of the glass spring's performance came under close scrutiny, because of which it came to light that it was formally not usual to register the temperature in the chronometer room, except during the annual public trials. Prompted by the springs, regular temperature observations in the chronometer room were introduced. Greenwich time became a function of temperature measurement and its constant surveillance. Despite Beaufort's request, Aerie and Dent became absorbed with projects of design rather than material. Most significantly, a chronometer with a concealed telltale, an idea carried over from the ruthless techniques of labor discipline in factories. In a private correspondence with Beaufort, Aerie noted, now it cannot be denied that the thing, if concealed, is of the nature of a spy. But in the first place, it has none of the envy, hatred, and bad or selfish passions of a human spy. And in the next place, it might be employed in the first instance simply to collect evidence. There is my casuistry for you. Chronometry and factory discipline were united in Aries' moral science. Interest in the glass springs almost seemed to have run down. That is, until 1840, when the partnership between Arnold and Dent had a revenue broken. The change in dense circumstances is crucial to understanding the fate of the glass springs. Just as the 1820s glass crisis was all about regulation of trade and control of foreign imports, so was Dent's decision to centralise all his capital in a single manufacturing. Following the split with Arnold, Dent acquired a factory at Somerset Wharf and concentrated the separate branches of the pot making trade under one roof and one management, his own. No longer a partner in a firm, he was now an owner of factories and an industrialist 
with an intense ambition to have the best, and I believe only complete, manufacturing of chronometers in London, and I may almost say the world. In 1833, as a member of the Clockmakers Company, Dent had lobbied government demanding heavier import duties on foreign watches, principally made in Switzerland, a country exempt from taxes, rates, and tithes, and without point laws to force up the value of labor. But in the early 1840s, following the dissolution of his partnership with Arnold, Dent's approach changed. He called instead for corn law repeal, deregulation that would justify a drop in wages. He noted since splitting with Arnold and heading up his own works, he had made more English watches than at any prior period, and consequently had paid more for labor. For Dent, his timekeepers could outcompete foreign manufacturers specifically because they were painstakingly compensated for variable temperature, and so vastly superior. But this compensation took a great sacrifice in time and additional labor of the artisan. Dent gave lectures at, presti at prestigious societies on his research, but also on the construction of watches and chronometers. In these, he would take one of his watches and pull it apart, examining each piece before the audience, dividing them into groups, and showing the range of operations the raw materials had undergone to reach the finished piece, and listing the number of different trades for each required, 43. As he did so, he listed the necessary parts and divisions of his total factory. The watch became a factory in miniature. In the audience of one such lecture given in 1837, eminent American mathematics professor Joseph Henry noted in his diary that Dent illustrates the great division of labor which is required to produce cheap and good articles where the labor-saving machine is not used or cannot at present be applied. When Dent acquired the factory at Somerset Wharf, three years later, he brought all the divisions under one roof around such enormous labor-saving machines. In private, Dent noted to Henry that his glass frames worked exceptionally well, but that different materials take different times to acquire permanent elasticity. The glass frames took too long, and in that time, good capital was locked up in the manufacturing. For Dent, it was only the level of the wage, raised by the high price of corn, which prevented English watches and chronometers from dominating home and international markets. And it was above all the exquisite temperature compensation of his chronometers that would enable British manufacturers to dominate without protections. Joining the clamor of industrialists, he argued for free trade and the repeal of the Corn Laws. <clears throat> Just a few months on, in early February of 1842, Dent wrote to Airy with a tentative proposal for an improved solution to the temperature problem, which he termed secondary continuous compensation. This would move the ordinary compensation weights on a change of temperature in a direction nearly concentric with the center of motion, and so minimize variations in the isochronism of the system. He described a constant sliding scale approach to temperature fluctuations. The problem was a complicated one because of the marked difference between the effects of temperature change on the inertia of the balance and the tension of the spring. It's just too many variables. Dent reckoned if he could remove the variable of the balance's changing inertia, the result of its expansion, then he could make the action of balance and spring law-like. And he reckoned he could remove this variable by the substitution of metal with glass in the balance, and the assumption that any expansion in the glass was negligible and so could be safely ignored. In 1754, concerned with the building of temperature-compensated pendulums for precision clocks, Civil engineer John Smeaton published a description of a new pyrometer to establish precise coefficients for different materials expansion. One of the findings of Smeaton's research was the minimal expansion of glass tubes. Thirty years on, as William Roy, head of the Ordnance Survey, laid out the baseline for the survey of England using steel chains constructed on the principle of a watch chain and subjected to constant temperature measures, a captain in the horse guards directed him to Smeaton's measurements. And Roy chose to calibrate the watch chain survey lengths with standardized glass tubes made of the Fleet Street glass works. The bottom half of this plate is concerned with how the cases of the glass tubes are joined together. It's the top half that's interesting here. The cases containing the tubes are set on their stands, 
and the central case is open to reveal the glass tube inside. The covers either side show the horizontal stems of thermometers whose bulbs hung inside close to the tubes, each of which was about 20 foot long. This was a new standard of precision measurement. Roy's survey set the pattern. Survey lengths were typically calibrated against glass tubes. British surveys based their authority on Smeaton's pendulum compensation measurements. And it worked both ways, as shown by astronomer and stockbroker Francis Bailey's work on the mercurial compensation pendulum published in 1823. The table is dominated by the results of precision experiment, uh, expansion measurements by surveyors and those engaged in the review of standards for surveys, both in France and Britain. The precedents mattered to them who wrote to Airy explaining that, for his secondary compensation research, I refer for all the dilatations to Mr. Bailey's table. We know, thanks to the British Museum's analysis, that dense springs contain a remarkably high lead content, while the balance does not. For the expansion of the high lead spring, Dent referred to the results of Lavoisier and Laplace, thermometry advanced in the review of French standard measures for surveys. But Dent's glass balance is the really interesting part. Remember, it's a kelp glass with no lead, entirely unlike the spring. The expansion of Dent's glass balance was defined using Roy's 1785 survey results. Dent's glass balance was calibrated against the baseline of the Ordnance Survey of Britain, intended to be the basis for the commutation of tides. The relation with these surveys of standards was timely, in the wake of the 1834 fire that destroyed the Houses of Parliament and the national standards of length, standard measures were under intense scrutiny, not least by air. The problem was whether those hallowed and singular parliamentary standards that had been the embodiment of national metrology, now destroyed, could ever be recovered. Just as he applied mechanisms of factory discipline in the construction of his plot mechanisms, dense patron airy saw these questions of standards, maintenance, and mechanical measures as applicable and general throughout the national economy. And he was far from alone. The age of reform saw a drive to bring factory and political economies into correspondence, and standards and tax as the principal means to this end. Survey measures and national politics were not just connected for reasons of patriotism, they were the means of this correspondence. In 1832, Airy had acted as advisor to Parliament and the Ordnance Survey on the mathematics of the division of counties for the commutation of tides, the transmutation of the traditional worth of farmland into hard cash, mobilised vast surveys that would make land evaluation possible and credible, surveys based on lengths calibrated against the expansion of bloods. For industrialists, the closely linked repeal of the Corn Laws Regulations which not only set the value of commuted tides, but kept the price of bread artificially high by heavy duty on imports, justified a reduction in the wages of factory workers. Wages that were dense particular concern with the manufacture of mechanical temperature compensation in his own factories. I think these halfpenny tokens, produced round the corner from dense factory and workshops, are really eloquent on the connection between wage labour and the corn laws. Since the 1780s, Britain had suffered from a small uh, crisis in small change. There just wasn't enough in circulation to pay the rapidly increasing proportion of the population on pitiful factory wages. In response, industrialists began producing their own trade tokens, often with moral and political slogans. The promise of the free trade industrialists was that with corn law repeal, bread, here symbolised by the wheat, would be cheap and plentiful. Their motivation was the further reduction of the pittance wages. The connections between the regulation of plots and of the national market were explicit. In February 1842, Arian Dent corresponded almost daily on the design of um, Dent's proposed mechanical system of secondary continuous temperature compensation, founded on his comp uh, calibration against the material compensation of glass. In the middle of this flurry of correspondence, Airy wrote to the editor of Political Weekly, The Examiner, proposing a solution to the problem of the Corn Laws. Significantly, Airy described the great machine of the corn market as a chronometer, gaining and losing in rate with temperature. 
arguing that the uniformity of movement of any machine is to be secured not by accelerating it when moving most slowly and retarding it when moving most quickly, but by accelerating it when losing speed and retarding it when gaining speed, that the motion is rendered more uniform than it would be without interference. The solution Airy proposed to the problem of corn rates was to take a fixed duty based on an average price, the primary compensation, and add or subtract from this sum based on the past two averages of price, the secondary compensation. The result, a continuous sliding scale. Airy proposed the solution of dense secondary co temperature compensation to the corn market. Characteristically of Airy, and indeed of Dent, the solution he preferred was a mechanical one. A mechanical solution might perhaps obviate the fundamental fear of the two managers, over-dependence on skilled labour. Their correspondence was peppered with references to the problem of depending on the talent and ability of the workmen, and removing this reliance on human care was the principal criterion in their assessment of mechanisms. With Dent going so far as to write to Airy in September 1842, while I consider the principle perfect and capable of being made by a careful workman, Still, I am of the opinion that it must more or less depend on his practical care and experience, of which I have a great dread. In the summer of 1842, just a few months on from Airy's letter to the examiner, and following their correspondence on temperature compensation, Dent began to consider its application in the construction of a new clock for the Royal Exchange. This building was the edifice of commutation. Its clock was to be a finely compensated pendulum, rated against an exquisite chronometer. On its completion in 1845, and in consideration of the construction of a new clock for the Houses of Parliament, Airy wrote, I shall state without hesitation that I believe the clock you have constructed for the Royal Exchange to be the best in the world, as regards accuracy of going and striking, and that I consider you the most proper person to be entrusted with the construction of another clock of similar pretensions. The Factory Act of June 7, 1844 stated that the hours of work indicated by the factory clock must be regulated by a public clock. As the most accurate public clock in the world, where that accuracy was a function of dense secondary compensation calibrated against the expansion of the glass balance, dense exchange clock regulated factory hours. These hours were the constant struggle between the worker and the capitalist, the factory manager, who by nibbling and cribbling at minutes and seconds stole from the wage value of the labour expended. Cruikshank famously satirised how industrialists exploited the factory acts and time discipline to lower wages yet further, wasting bodies to the virtue of competitive pricing. This image shows the sweating system, where if the output of the worker fell below the average rate, she or he would be scrapped. Dent's work on the Royal Exchange clock coincided with his finalisation of the patent for the secondary compensation, and he wrote to Airy noting that this would be the last public scientific work he would engage in, as my future life will be devoted to the practical introduction of my improvements. The concentration of capital in larger manufacturers, as in the case of Dent, went along with the work of standardisation. Dent could not have made a more extensive introduction in his improvements than in the construction of the Royal Exchange and subsequently the Westminster Clock, Big Ben. The most public of state standards which set the standard for working hours in Britain. In future years, the going rate of the Westminster Clock would be further regulated by the adding or taking away of copper coins, literal penny weights. The great clock took a tax to be regulated. At the beginning of this talk, I asked you to keep two questions in mind. The Frodsham argument, if Dennis glass springs performed so well, why was there only one of them? And the Denison argument, that according to Dent, the springs did indeed work exceptionally well, but the workmen would not. I want to propose some answers. First, Dent's glass was not singular because it was a failure. It was singular because standards functioned by the comparison of one against many. Dent's glass was an embodied standard as much as the parliamentary standard yard enclosed in a glass case and embedded in the masonry of Westminster. Dent's glass, like the parliamentary standards, was authoritative precisely for its removal from circulation. Such embodied standards set masters apart from workmen by judging workmanship of many against the single material form. Second, Dent's initial substitution of glass to remove the troublesome variable of heat was motivated by the supposition that glass might do away with the lengthy and costly skilled labour of temperature 
organization. Finding this was not the case, when Dent noted the workmen would not work the glass, he was recalling less their recalcitrance than his own confessed dread of dependence on skilled work. To recap, the Corn Laws set the rate of factory wages, and they set the rate of tithes commuted into cash. When Dent became a factory owner, he joined free trade industrialists in fighting for the repeal of the Corn Laws. But while he argued for the removal of one set of regulations, his last work placed Dent and his chronometry at the heart of the new emerging world. Remember how the glass balance differed from the high lead content spring. It was a kelp glass with no lead in it at all. It shared the composition of the glass rods used by William Roy to measure the baseline of the Great Trigonometric Survey of England and by ordnance surveys that came after Roy. Dent's glass balance was calibrated against the glass rods from the great surveys that were themselves used to calculate the tides. His precision compensated timekeepers were calibrated against the glass balance, and in turn, these timekeepers calibrated the great clocks, which gave the standard for British factory time. And what of the spring? With its remarkably high lead content, it reflected the highest duty of the most heavily regulated manufacturer. Remember, there were two in the British Museum collection, one fitted to a balance and trial, the other perfect and unused. Remember the high magnification images, the trial spring thicker and flatter, the unused spring rounded and fine. When Dent spoke of the springs to Joseph Henry, he noted they were not like steel springs, but thicker and flatter. The purpose of the unused spring was never to be a demonstration model of those on trial. Its purpose was to look exactly like a steel spring, but perfectly rem rendered in luminous glass. Its purpose was social and symbolic, a 19th century attribute of innovative art. XRF showed the two springs shared the same composition, except the surface of this display piece is coated in potassium from the fingers that have held it out to be admired. It played the greatest role of all in the corn market chronometer. On 14th of February 1845, while Dent applied for the commission to manufacture Big Ben, Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel addressed the House of Commons on the subject of the repeal of glass duty. It's hard to express just how important this address was. This financial statement was the direct precedent for the repeal of the Corn Laws the following year, in 1846. Peel's words are worth reading. If you permit this article to be free of duty, it is difficult to foresee in the first place to what perfection this beautiful fabric may not be brought. And secondly, it is impossible to say what new purposes glass manufactured by our own skill and capital may not be applied. I hold in my hand the balanced spring of a chronometer made of glass, instead of the ordinary material steel. I understand that it possesses a greater degree of elasticity and that it has a greater power of resisting the alternations of heat and cold. The manufacture is so expensive and requires such skill on the part of the workmen but I do not believe, under the present uh, system of restrictions, that this exquisite discovery can be generally applied. I noted earlier in this talk that glass manufacturing in Britain was heavily regulated, that the history of the regulation of glass in Britain was a history of social regulation, and that glass itself was taxed. When Peel held out the glass balance frame and called for the withdrawal of the duty, he drew on each of these points. But Swift's quotation in full is useful here. Satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own, which is the chief reason for that kind reception it meets with in the world, and that so very few are offended with it. Glass was a medium of social comment through distortion of the existing order. For all the calls for free trade reported to be calls for deregulation, the reality was, like airy solution to the repeal of the Corn Laws, an extreme increase in the intensity and extent of other regulatory practices. Regulations calibrated against dense glass balance. Final slide. This is Punch's depiction of Peel in the House of Commons after his financial statement, where he held out dense glass spring to successfully call for the repeal of the glass tax, the precedent for the 1846 repeal of the Corn Laws. And here, the song Punch wrote in tribute to Peel's performance. Much more than a prop in this political theatre, the specific glass and the complex history of labor relations it embodied was a powerful tool mobilized in the design and architecture of reform Britain. Try to recite just a few lines of Punch's verse, and it's hard to resist the Newcastle accent. 
Here's to each Tory and Radical too. My, obviously, my accent's not Newcastle, right? Just only my income tax passports. And you'll see how completely John Bull I shall do by taking the duty of glass points. Let the bill pass. John's such an axe. I'll warrant he'll find an excuse in the glass. Hard to resist the riotous history of labour in Watts. <laughs>